Chapter Twenty Three of Parables from Nature. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Parables from Nature by Margaret Gatty. Chapter Twenty Three: The Light of Life. Except the Lord build the house, their labor is but loss that build it. Psalms, Chapter One Hundred Twenty Seven, Verse One. What more could have been done for it than I have done? The cry came from an afflicted heart. It was uttered by Hans Janssen, the Hamburg printer's only son, as he sat moaning over a dying rose tree in the corner of a little backyard behind his father's house. Hans Janssen was what is commonly called not all there. That is, he could not see and comprehend the things of this life as his neighbors did. More than half of what passed around him was hidden from his eyes. He was in part though not altogether, an idiot. It was a great distress to his parents that this should be the case. It had been so once, however. But being good Christians, they had reconciled themselves to it, and learned by degrees to see comfort through the cloud. If Hans was below the rest of the world in some ways, he was above them in others. The fear of God and the love of his neighbor had come to him almost as an instinct at any rate without the struggles some people have to go through before their hearts are touched by either one or the other. He wouldn't have missed saying his prayers night and morning, or grace at meals to please an emperor, and an unkind word about any one could never be got out of him. Truly, their Hans was ripening for a better state of existence, whether he had any book-learning or not. He had nothing to fear but everything to hope for from death. And he had one passion, one special cause of enjoyment and delight, he doted on flowers, and was seldom seen without one in his buttonhole all the summer through. But this was because his good nature had made him many friends, who took a pleasure in seeing him pleased, and gave him a nosegay when they could. It was very well known that he had no garden of his own. Mr. Janssen's house was a red brick one, in a row with a square enclosure in front, covered with pebbles, and a square yard at the back, which had a pump in the middle and a dog kennel on one side. It is true this yard was covered with soil, and there were scrubby patches of grass upon it here and there, but it was used for a drying ground, and had never once been brightened by flowers, since the day it was first parcelled out, and the walls were built around it, across which were now stretched the lines on which the linen was hung to dry. The fact was, Mr. Janssen had not wished for a garden. He was busy from morning to night at his printing business in the town. His wife had quite enough on her hands in household cares, and no effectual work could be expected from an idiot child. How Hans came to be so fond of flowers was a mystery, but there are many mysteries of this sort in the world. It had been so from his baby days, and many were the hours he had spent, unnoticed, in a corner of that backyard, grubbing in the old black soil, making believe to have a garden with beds and walks like those he had seen elsewhere. Nay, once or twice he had tried to grow mustard and cress, and even sweet peas, a few seeds of which were given him by a neighbor's child, but somehow or other nothing ever came of these real attempts, and he had to make himself happy with the make-believe garden at the end. But it was no make-believe plant he was wailing over now, but a real géant de bataille rose-tree, which had been given him many weeks before. It was thus. A good-natured nursery gardener, who knew his father, had let him walk through his grounds one flower-show day before the company came and having by chance noticed poor Hans sobbing from excitement at sight of the glories round him, his own heart melted, for he had an only and clever son himself, and he felt sorry for the darkness over his friend's child. So when Hans was going away, he gave him not only a nosegay of the tulips and hyacinths, but a fine young rose-tree in a pot, as fine a géant de bataille as had ever been raised, said he to Hans, as he offered it adding that it would flower in six or eight weeks and brighten all the place up by its rich blaze of colour. Hans trembled as he received it, and he stood with his mouth half open, irresolute and abashed, wanting to speak yet not daring. "'What is it, boy?' asked the nursery gardener. "'Speak out.' "'How do you make your flowers so beautiful?' gasped Hans, half afraid of what he had said. "'Well, well,' returned the nursery gardener with a smile. Some in one way, and some in another, but we don't tell our secrets to everybody. Nevertheless, I'll tell you how to make your rose beautiful, for you'll make no bad use of anything, I'll be bound. You've a yard, or a court, or some place with soil in it, eh? Yes, yes. 
Then I'll tell you what you must do, pursued the nursery gardener. Dig a hole in a sheltered place, pretty deep, you know, and put in a bone or two and some hair. My son shall give you a handful at the bottom. Then turn the plant out of the pot, not disturbing the ball of earth for the world, remember, and set it right down upon the hair. Then fill up the hole neatly with soil and say nothing about what you've done to anybody, and there's an end. Keep it sheltered, mind, and water it at first, or if you see it get very dry, and with soap suds whenever you can get them. Soap suds and bones and hair are the main things. There's nothing like them for bringing roses to perfection. You'll have flowers as big as a hat and as bright as cherries before the summer's over, if you do as I say and look well after the plant. There, good luck to you and it. Good-bye. And this was the plant, this poor, wizened thing over which Hans was moaning. But how had it come to this? That was the difficulty. The gardener's son had given Hans the hair, and he had found the bones. There were plenty by the dog-kennel. And he had dug the hole and put them at the bottom, and he had turned the plant out of the pot and not broken the ball of earth, and he had placed it upon the hair and filled up the hole and watered it at first, and whenever he saw it get very dry, and with soap-suds on a wash-day, for he had only to ask and have without question or trouble. He had done everything, in short, surely everything, for he had put it in the most sheltered spot he could find, in the selfsame corner where he had played at make-believe gardens as a child, and it seemed as if an old dream were suddenly come true. And as to looking well after it, could a miser have watched his gold with more jealous care? And no one had interfered, for he had told nobody, partly from some indefinite idea that the nursery gardener had ordered him not, partly because he thought it would be so nice to surprise his mother some day before the summer was over, by the rich blaze of color that was to brighten all the place. The very maid who hung out the clothes in the yard didn't know of it, for to keep it secret and make the shelter of the tree more complete, he had set up boards across the corner where it was planted, from wall to wall, and no one could see what was there. They looked upon the boards as some idle freak of the idiot mind. It was the buds that failed first, those buds which ought to have swollen and grown larger day by day. Even his eye, sharpened now by anxious care, could detect that they rather dwindled than increased in size, and observing this more and more as time went on, he one day summoned courage to walk to the nursery gardens and tell his fears to the giver of the plant. But he, when he found that all he had ordered had been done, only smiled. I tell you what, said he, and from long experience there's nothing like bones and hair for bringing roses to perfection. You can't go wrong with them. Give it a little more water or soap suds. You've perhaps a light soil in your place. Give it more water. The buds will swell fast enough, I'll be bound. Indeed, I fancy you're watching it so closely you can't see true. It's easy enough to do that, I can tell you. The buds are grown, I suspect, though you don't think so. Leave it to itself. Don't fancy anything wrong. It's sure to be right with bones and hair and soap suds. They're the finest rose manure in the world. Hans listened with his mouth open, nodded his head with a thank you at the end, and went away hoping he had not seen true. And he did not take the boards down nearly so often afterwards, lest his watching too closely should do harm. But every time he did take them down he grew more and more unhappy. The healthy green of the leaves was no longer to be seen. As for the buds, they shriveled gradually more and more. Growth anywhere there was none. Inch by inch the plant was dying, or Hans thought so, and he rubbed his eyes for further light in vain. And one day, when the last leaves which remained had crinkled up and turned brown, he sat down on the ground and wailed, as I have said, What more could I have done for it than I have done? The dream of a dream come true at last was over. The make-believe garden was still the only one he had ever enjoyed. He must go back to it again. He replaced the boards, for he shrank from the very sight of the dying plant, and sat down on the ground again, though he scarcely knew why. But presently there was a barking of the dog, and an opening of the door, and a shouting of, Hans! by his mother. The nursery gardener was passing that way, and had called to admire the roses he expected to see. Hans could not speak, but led the way to the corner of the yard, and when they were there he pointed to the boards before he took them down, and exclaimed, trying to smile through his tears, I couldn't have sheltered it more, could I? It's never been scorched, or chilled, or blown upon even. It's had bones and hair and water and all you ordered, and I've looked well after it, and yet it's dead, I know." As he spoke, Hans lifted down the boards and exposed the withered tree. 
the nursery gardener stared at it, and then at Hans, in genuine amazement. "'You don't mean to say you kept it so all the time,' cried he. "'Why, what have you been thinking about, man? How could you expect it to live? Why, it's had no light!' "'You said nothing about that,' replied Hans, his face distorted with bewilderment and grief. "'You said you made roses beautiful with bones and hair and soap-suds, and that I should make mine beautiful with them, too.' "'But not without sunshine,' shouted the nursery gardener, quite excited at the idea of such a mistake. Hans made no answer. He could not utter another word. He sat down on the ground again and hid his face in his hands. "'I must have spoken like a fool,' exclaimed the nursery gardener, half to himself. But who would have thought of anybody fancying a plant could get on without light? Well, perhaps I ought to have thought, though, added he, as his eye fell on poor Hans's doubled-up figure. Then, laying his hand on the lad's shoulder, it came into his heart to try and explain matters. Look up, Hans, said he. It's not your fault at all. It's mine. There was something I forgot to tell you. I spoke like a fool when I talked of making roses beautiful with manure and things like that, as if they could do it themselves. I didn't mean that. It is God who makes the roses, you know, and he makes them so that they can't do without the light he chooses them to live in, and that's the light from heaven, do you see? Here the nursery gardener paused to consider how he must go on, and Hans shuffled a bit, and then looked up at his friend. And his friend saw the light from heaven streaming on that sad, half-intelligent face, with the red eyes straining upwards for comprehension, and he proceeded. So they can't do without God's light. Let you give them what manure you will. They're only helps, Hans, such things as those. A man may help or hinder what God intends by good or bad management, it's true. But that's all, and that's all I meant. Bones and hair and soapsuds are the finest rose manure in the world, that's true, too, and it's a great secret. But they're all nothing, nothing, lad, without God's secret, the light from heaven. Do you see what I mean, Hans? I'm trying, said Hans. Hans, continued the nursery gardener, it's been my fault, not yours, and you shall have another rose-tree, or we'll save this one yet, for if there's a bit of life left in it, God's light may bring it round. But tell me, you were a very good lad, you know, at times. Indeed, I fancy always. But no matter, we'll call it at times. What makes you ever good? Hans's catechism had been short but sound, and he answered at once, God's grace. Now that's just it, shouted the nursery gardener in delight. That's just what I meant and all the schooling and teaching and trying in the world won't do without God's grace, will they, Hans?" Hans nodded his negative assent. "'No, they're only manures and helps,' pursued the nursery gardener, "'and very good things, no doubt, the same as bones and hair and soap-suds for roses, and there's nobody can dispute about them. But all the helps in the world can do nothing without the main thing God chooses them to thrive by, and that's God's grace for a man and God's light for a plant.' and what one is for one, that the other is for the other, and it's my opinion it's the light of heaven for both." If Hans did not quite follow the thread of the nursery gardener's argument, he must be excused. The nursery gardener understood what he meant himself, and that was something, and Hans added to his small stock of observations the useful truth he had bought so dearly, it that plants cannot live without light. Those who are interested further in his fate will be glad to hear that the nursery gardener soon after turned one side of the old printer's backyard into a garden at his own expense, and gave Hans such plants and help that both mother and son had a few bright flowers of their own the next year to delight their eyes. But more than this, the poor lad proved so watchful and attentive, so obedient, too, to advice in his own small matters, and the rational occupation to an end seemed so evidently to clear something from the confusion of his mind that it struck the nursery gardener one day to trust him with some little employment on his more important premises, and the experiment was not unsuccessful. On the one subject of flowers Hans had become not only trustworthy but intelligent. And so it came to pass that it was in the nursery garden among the flowers his only idea of an earthly paradise, that the poor idiot ended his days. There, Guileless as the beautiful creatures which surrounded him, and trustful as the highest wisdom could have made him, he lived, and thence did the spirit, so long pent in an imperfect earthly tabernacle, return to the great lord of life and light and intelligence, without whom nothing is strong, nothing is holy. End of chapter 23